Hey, everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest tonight is Juliana Hever, also known as the Plant-Based Dietitian. She's the author of The Vegetarian Diet and the Complete Idiot's Guide to Plant-Based Nutrition. Juliana is a registered dietitian, the host of a wellness talk show called What Would Juliana Do?, which airs on the Living Network. She's author of the new book that we're going to discuss tonight, The Vegetarian Diet, and the best-selling book, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Plant-Based Nutrition. She's also a nutrition columnist for Veg News Magazine, and she co-authored The Complete Idiot's Guide to Gluten-Free Vegan Cooking, and she's a recipe contributor to both New York Times best-selling Forks Over Knives books. So please welcome Juliana Hever. How you doing? Hello, Chef AJ. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. It's so fun because we have not worked together in so long. We did about 65 episodes of the hit internet sensation, The Chef and the Dietitian. I watched a few of them today to get in the mood for the show. And it was <laughs> Yay! My, my favorite part of working with you is, is the, like you just did your laugh. It was so easy to make you laugh. It was my favorite part. Oh, well, my favorite part of working with you is that you make me laugh all the time. You're so hilarious. So thank you. <laughs> So, so what was your favorite episode of all the ones we did? Do you remember? Do you have a favorite? I have so many favorites. I think one of them was the, the joking one we do with Dr. Furman. Exactly. I think, no, okay, that was one of my favorites. But my all-time favorite, I think, was with Dr. Campbell when we did it live with the kale chips. Oh, and we both kissed him. We both kissed him. That was great. Yeah, and we surprised him. That was adorable. I, I love the, and if you haven't seen our show, please just go to YouTube and put in Chef and the Dietitian. And you can watch 65 amazing recipe videos that Juliana and I did together a few years ago. I love the one with Dr. Campbell. I love the one with Dr. Furman. And I love the one where you where you were dressed like a nun. That was one of my favorites. Oh, that was hilarious, yes. That was a good one, too. Well, I was watching them today. They are pretty good, if you ask me. And obviously, they were effective because because of them, both of us eventually got our own television shows. That's right. Yeah, and every time I see anyone anywhere around the world, they always mention how much they love our episodes together. Well, we're going to have to have a reunion one day, but, you know, Charles just located one of the lost episodes, so as soon as he has time to edit that, we'll have to get it out. It's the episode we shot with Mayor Ed Smith III of Marshall, Texas, so it's going to be a good one, and it's a good recipe. Yeah, that was a fun one. I look forward to seeing it. Great. So if you don't mind, we'll first discuss your book, but then we had a lot of people writing questions, because anytime we have a medical expert on, people want to know stuff. So we'll start with talking about your book, okay? Sounds great. So where did you get the idea to write the vegetarian diet? How did you think of that? Well, by the way, you say it perfectly. It's such a tongue twister to get out of your mouth. But essentially, I've always wondered why the Mediterranean diet was considered the gold standard in the research when, in fact, like what you and I are always talking about is the incredible medical advantages and health advantages of following a plant-based diet and all of that research. So I've always kind of wondered, well, how is that possible? And maybe the Mediterranean diet is a plant-based diet. And I've looked at the research, but I kind of just like kind of looked at it very, you know, briefly. But then a year and a half ago, or now it's a little longer, I was asked to speak on a cruise in the Mediterranean. And, of course, this was like the best opportunity ever because who says no to a cruise in the Mediterranean? And while I was there, I was sitting in my stateroom, and I talk about this in the book too, looking out on the waters. I'm like, okay, I've got to figure this out. I was really inspired. I loved the food. I, we had gone in and out of, of Rome, Italy, and I just absolutely love everything Italian. And so I thought, well, what a good opportunity to really dig in and put it together. And the whole idea just came about. So I started talking about the history, and then when I came home, I delved in. I mean, I was reading Plato and Aristotle, like all of these like original thinkers and, and Hippocrates and all this information that we've gathered on diet and everything that started in the Mediterranean region. And I, and I studied it from there until Ansel Keys and the Seven Country Study and all 20th century when so much happened and when they really put together the idea that diet was related to heart disease and to, related to health. And when that whole the cholesterol theory and everything came to, to be, all just blossomed and exploded. And that's when everything kind of went crazy with the research. And here and we've, we've gone leaps and bounds in the last, what, 50, 60 years. And now we know so much about the, not everything, but we know so much about the relationship between what we put in our bodies and how our health is ultimately. That's great. 
great. And one of the things I loved about your book, Juliana, and you said this, I, I took extensive notes, because by the way, a lot of times people get booked five or six months ahead of the show, and I read their book by the time they're out. I forgot, but I literally read your book on Sunday, coming home from Summerfest, where we both spoke. So it's really fresh in my mind. And I've taken some notes. And one of the things I love is that you said that the Mediterranean diet is healthy, not because of the olive oil, but in spite of it. So can you can you expound on that a little bit? Yes. What I wanted to do was kind of tear up the myths. There are so many myths that came out of that. Of course, there's so many myths about diet in general, as you and I see wherever we travel and talk to people. But there's a lot of myths that are kind of prevalent about the Mediterranean diet. And I think the most predominant one is the fact that it's the olive oil that makes it healthy. So you see people eating their steak but pouring on olive oil and saying, oh, it's healthy. Or they're eating, you know, whatever, and they kind of used it. It's kind of changed and morphed into this, you know, really health-promoting food. But so I, I really wanted to get to the bottom of that and find out because there is a lot of research that shows that this diet that included a high amount of olive oil was healthy. So how do we put that together? And when you look at all of the research on oils and fats and fatty acids, and it gets really complicated and it gets really, it can get very obfuscated and, and um, complex. It looks like, you know, there's a lot of reasons that the Mediterranean diet was effective, and I don't believe that it's because of the olive oil. I think that it may very well be in spite of the olive oil. And my thesis and that I confirmed with this studying was that it really is healthy because, number one, it is a whole food plant-based diet. It really was from the beginning. It, that's the essence of, a plant, of the Mediterranean diet. And also there's a lot of other factors, like the fact that these people that, they, that were studied, they exercised and moved more. They ate, you know, there's like the synergy of eating all these whole plant foods. There was like so many other reasons that the plant-based diet was so efficacious. It's not just the oil. And we know, so, my, so I have all these conclusions and I go into details in the book about fats and oils. But like what you and I always say to our audiences is that fat is 100%, I mean, oil is 100% pure fat. It's about 2,000 calories per cup. And now in this new day and age in 2015, about 70% of the U.S. population is overweight and obese. So most of us don't need all of those calories. And it would behoove us to just eat the olive instead of the olive oil and to focus more on the types of fats we're consuming. Like we can get that information from this, from these studies that we could focus on the types of fat we're, we're consuming. And it doesn't have to be from, from oil. Right. And, you know, so many things you see on television, cooking shows and like these doctors on TV, they make it sound like oil, it, like without it, you'll die. But if there was something truly beneficial in the olive oil, like you say, wouldn't it be in the olive? And it is. And honestly, a lot of the nutrients, I have this little thing, a little diagram, a chart in the book where I take the olive and you compare it to the olive oil and look at all of the nutrients. So basically you're getting a ton more fat, a ton more calories, but you're taking out most, like the vast majority of the micronutrients and the, all of the fiber. So you are left with that. And there are phytochemicals in there, but you can get those from the olives and you can get those things from all the different types of whole plant foods that we consume. So absolutely. It's the best way, like you and I always talk about the best way to save calories is to just skip the oil or at least minimize it as much as you possibly can. Absolutely. And it seems like that's one of the hardest points for us to get across to people, especially the people that we both work with that are desiring to lose weight. Exactly. And it also seems to be the most effective thing. Like if people are eating this perfectly healthy, wholesome diet, all plant-based, very nutritious, but they are adding oil or they've had some oil in their diet, I've seen for what now, 10 years now, that the best results, if someone really wants to take down their weight or take down their cholesterol and improve their lipid profile, oil does the trick. Yep, I, I agree. It, it just seems this is such a hard point for us to drive home <laughs> sometimes. Because of all, because of the Mediterranean diet and because people have, and the whole coconut oil is a whole other myth that people have just be, made into the superfood too. Right, oh. we're like up against like, you know, all of these myths and, and, um, and misinformation that we see every day everywhere. Right. Well, I mean, they, they actually have, are glorifying these oils when our ancestors, I don't, I mean, our ancestors couldn't have eaten coconut oil, right? They couldn't even have opened a coconut. Right. Yeah. Let alone had access to tropical fruits, really, in most, in most regions around the world. So when, when they talk about the Mediterranean or the Mediterranean diet, are they, talking about a group, are they talking about certain countries in particular, like Italy and Greece, or are all these countries lumped into what we call the, the Mediterranean? Because they, they seem to eat a little bit different diets in some of the different countries. Yeah, that is such a good question. And no, really, it's, it is a couple of regions that were really highly studied. Like there were a couple of regions in Greece and there were a couple of regions in Italy and stuff like that that were really kind of focused on. But then you're right. If you look around the region, there are different, uh, different types of cuisine and there's 
with different types of spices. And really, traditionally, the Mediterranean diet includes about 18 different nations and is bordered by three continents. So there's a lot of different possibilities. But really, the science looked at just a few regions that were the ones that you, you mostly hear about. But what I did with this book was because I had to do the recipes. So I have 66 recipes, and I didn't want to do just all, you know, Italian and, and sure. Greek. So I, I went out and did some of the more uh, Middle Eastern cuisine because those are some of those are on the Mediterranean border as well. And just try to kind of open it up just for flavor opportunities and just for some variety. Well, you have a recipe for an Israeli chopped salad, and I, 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 eat, a, I eat a salad at least twice a week. I love those kind of salads. They're my favorite ones because the smaller you chop it, the more you can get in. <laughs> yes, totally, and they're so fresh and refreshing and delicious and crisp. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I love – there's so much about your book I love. It was actually very – very well written, I thought. Very, uh, very obviously, you really researched this, but just some of the things you said just resonated with me so much. Like, for example, I'm, I've got let me sure. You said, and I, I, I believe this so much that every single bite either harms or helps us. And I thought that was just so true because people don't really think about food that way. And one of the things I really loved is you said about how preventative medicine is still considered alternative medicine. Yeah, isn't that bizarre? Yeah. It's, it's like, come on already. We know. We know. We know there's a link to diet. We see it every single day. And it drives me crazy. So today, every year, I go, about every year, I try to go to get a physical at my doctor. And every year, I, I go to Kaiser because, of course, my husband works at Kaiser. And so I went there, and it drives me nuts because every time I go there, they ask me, do you smoke? Do you exercise? How many days a week do you exercise? What's your intensity of exercise? Do you drink alcohol? Like all these questions, not one single question is what do you eat. Wow. That's crazy, huh? Yeah, I mean, if they could change that and ask people what they eat, I think that we'd have a different healthcare system altogether. That is so, that is just crazy, crazy. Yeah, I loved how you said that you had your dog on your lap when you were writing the book, because I, I, that's just, like, we're both Aries, and we have such, we have such similar tastes and things like that. It's, I just thought that was so cute. I know, we both love our doggies. Yeah, but Aww. he should, he should have no. had, had a co, if he really sat on your lap, he really should have had a co, co-writing credit, you know? He totally should have. Okay, he totally I'm, should. Okay, I have to. Well, I give him a lot of love in the book. <laughs> I'm here to advocate for uh, for him. So you, you, one of the things I love when you were talking about the book Whole and, and just about nutritional deficiencies is that we're, we're, we're so worried about deficiencies when in a- actuality it, we should be worried about the opposite with the standard American diet is all the excesses. Exactly. I mean, I have yet to find someone that has a protein deficiency. I've never even seen that in my entire 20 years in health and fitness industry. But, yeah, I think you ha- we do need to be aware of what we're consuming. And in that, I mean, we, there are certain nutrients that can, you know, tend to fall short if you're not eating the way we recommend, the whole food plant-based diet. If you're not eating your leafy greens and your beans, if you're not eating a wide variety of foods and you're stuck eating just, you know, I mean, it's very easy nowadays because there's so many delicious, you know, fun vegan foods. There's Miyoko's cheese and all these wonderful, you know, kind of really some that are really processed foods that are out there. And it's easy to get sucked into just, you know, eating too much of that junk food and not eat and not that Miyoko's cheese is junk food. No, but. no, no, no. Of course, we love her. She's going to be interviewed in two weeks. So we love oh, her. I love her and I'm obsessed with her cheese. It's absolutely phenomenal. But you have to look at the totality of the diet. Are you eating a nice wide variety? It should be the foundation of the diet needs to be from vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, and a little bit of nuts and seeds. And then you could, there's room for a little bit of, you know, a little bit of Miyoko's cheese once in a while and you can enjoy. But yeah, the deficiency thing, you know, we need to think about there's certain nutrients. I even have a chart called the notable nutrient sources chart because just to have a quick reference guide the things that we don't really need to be worried about the stuff we always talk about the protein the iron and stuff like that but we do if we do consume adequate amounts of all those foods we're going to get everything except for b12 and i i always want to shout out i think it's very important that anyone that's on a completely vegan diet needs to make sure that they're getting their B12, 2,500 micrograms a week. And I want to make sure that everyone's on top of that just because it's a needless deficiency right. that we don't need to see anymore. And, and do you, do you, do I, I, you, you did a great presentation at Summerfest with Dr. Gregor. You guys are, are delightful together. Do you, I know there was a question about that. Do you recommend the meth? There's two different types. Do you, do you have, do you recommend one over the other or one way of taking it over the other, such as the patch, the shot, the, 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 the under the tongue? I mean, or does it really not much matter as long as you're getting it? 
Well, as long as you're getting it first and foremost, but I do, if I had to preferentiate, you only really need a shot if you've got some kind of digestive issue, if you've got some kind, if you have, you know, an uh, inflammatory bowel disease or some kind of, any kind of um, condition where you may not be absorbing your nutrients. But you would know that if it's celiac disease or you have a lot of food allergies or you're, you know, it's, those are the kind of conditions where you actually need to inject it into your bloodstream. Other than that, you're fine with the sublingual. I'm going by, so Jack Norris and Dr. Greger, they, well, actually, Dr. Greger goes by Jack Norris his chart. He has this great chart out there uh, and it's all based on cyanocobalamin and so I'm just recommending cyanocobalamin, 2,500 micrograms a week. I tell people to get, the, I think the easiest way for most people, but you could break it up however you want, is to get the 1,000 microgram, there's my dog right there, the 1,000 <laughs> microgram supplements and then just taking it two to three times a week and you don't have to worry about it. But I mean, you know, the good thing about B12 is it's water soluble and I don't think there's any reported, uh, uh, what's it called, cases of toxicity. So, sure. it's, you know, it's something, it's, you're better to say to have a little bit more than it is to not have enough. Right, because, you know, I take it every day, and I always have it, not because I think I need more, but because when I tried to do it a few days a week, I forgot which days I took it, so I just dig it every day. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. And then if you're, in that case, you could take, like, 500 instead, instead of taking sure. the 1,000, and you'll be totally fine. That's sure. I don't, People are like that. I understand. Well, thanks, about, thanks for bringing up that important point, because just having the fortified plant milks and the nutritional yeast I don't think is really enough for them. Yeah, I mean, we don't know, and you're not really, you're not even actually quantifying it and knowing exactly how much. So it's just the most reliable way to get it. It's the most, it's so cheap. It's so effective. We know it raises your serum levels. And so we do, it's like about 50% of vegans are B12 deficient. So it, it's like the easiest thing to just prevent just by popping that pill and not having to worry about it. Do you see um, B12 deficiency in non-vegans ever? Of course, absolutely. Oh my gosh, absolutely. If, if people have any kind of GI issues as you get older, there's a lot of different reasons that people get B12 deficiency. It's absolutely not exclusive to vegans, but you know, because those are the, the the groups that I tend to talk to, it's the one nutrient we can't get directly from plants anymore because we're not drinking out of streams and eating produce without washing it. So that's why I'm always make sure that I just want to say that out loud because that's that is one of the primary reasons for B12 deficiency. We also see it in uh, babies that are breastfed from vegan moms that aren't taking B12. Interesting. So, yeah, you need to be aware of B12. So you, you do a whole lecture on debunking the most common nutritional myths. So I have heard that being vegan almost 40 years where people say, well, the vegan diet obviously isn't natural to us because we can't get B12 from it. And people use that as a reason to eat animal products. How do you address people that, that make that comment? Yeah, exactly. That's actually one of the myths is that it's, if, it's, if it's not in, in the diet is not natural. And my answer is what I said, like, we used to live in a different world. You know, we used to go and drink water out of the streams directly. And we used to go and we would, we would pick food off the, you know, out of the ground and just pop it in our mouth. But now we sterilize our food. Everything is absolutely clean. We can't get the B12 from the soil. That's where the animals get it. The only reason people that eat animals are more likely to get the B12 is because the animals ate the produce from the ground or whatever. It ate the dirt and got the B12 microorganisms into their body and becomes part of their flesh. And that's how they eat it. Yep. Yep. It's, uh, people will say anything as an excuse to not, <laughs> as to eat, you know, eat the foods they want to eat. You, oh, yeah. you, uh, I love the chapter you talk about. I like this because I love the, the, what you called it, revel in the rainbow. And you mentioned this. I thought this was so interesting because I love learning things I, I didn't know before, is that the World Health Organization attributes 1.7 million or 2.8% of deaths worldwide to low fruit and vegetable consumption and considers it one of the top 10 risk factors contributing to a, attributable mortality. That's, that's amazing. It's that, amazing. I mean, it's I, amazing. It's and I was reading that dietary guideline scientific committee report, that 500 page document that came out a few months ago, and it's like the majority of the population don't consume enough vegetables or fruit. Like barely, not even like the minimum five a day. Like it's just it's ridiculous. And it is one thing that every agency agrees on. The Institute of you know the USDA and the the American Cancer Society. Everyone suggests at least half your plate comes from fruits and vegetables. And people, you know, I mean. By the way, when they tabulate how many fruits, we've talked about this, how many fruits and vegetables people consume, they include stuff like French fries and ketchup as a vegetable and a fruit. Mm -hmm. so imagine how many people really are eating big salads and kale and potatoes, all, like the, all the real foods that, that yeah. we are recommending, just, not that many. Yeah, just you and me. So do you think that it's gotten worse? I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're 15 years younger than me, so you can't go back to the 60s and answer this, but has it, have people just traditionally in the United States always had a low fruit and vegetable consumption or do you think it got worse as the junk food just became more prevalent? 
Oh, I think the industrialization took over everything. But, I mean, when I was a kid, and not to date myself, but my mom didn't know what to do with vegetables. I hope she's not listening because I told her to listen. But if she's listening, I'm sorry. I love you, Mom. But she used to, like, take frozen those frozen Brussels sprouts, and it was, like, disgusting. Yeah. And that was my experience with vegetables. And so I grew up in the society where everything just became really super processed, and you can get the fruit rolls, and that's where you get your fruit, and you can get the, you know, like, it was just the junk food revolution was happening when I was a kid. So I don't know personally, but from what I read, absolutely. Because before that, you couldn't package food. You didn't have, you know, really good refrigerators that you could stock up a week's worth of produce. You had to eat seasonal. You had to eat local. You had, you know, that's what people basically consumed. And that's why when you look at all of these diets, like the traditional Mediterranean diet, people were so healthy because they were consuming the food of the earth. They were eating what they made, what was around them. And it was, it was much more so based on plant foods and fruits and vegetables and all that. It was just now... I think because of the industrialization and because of our love of meat. I think this whole with fast food and all that, I think that absolutely exacerbated it. It's, it's crazy. We've got a lot of work to do. Because you had mentioned in your book, and it's so funny, we have so many uh, parallels in our lives that you used to just absolutely love chocolate chip cookies, but now you feel the same way about your big salads. Oh, my God, yes. Oh, I know. But my sister to this day does not believe me that I don't want dessert. But we went to Summerfest. We were at Summerfest, and you saw all those desserts, AJ. And not, I didn't have one bite of one dessert that whole time because there was kale, and there was salads, and there was – yeah, who wants that stuff when you can have all this delicious food? And my sister thinks I'm joking, but I really don't want that stuff. Even if it's vegan and whole food, and I used to love your desserts, by the way. You were like my favorite. You made me realize that desserts can be insanely, incredibly decadent and healthy. And I can't even eat that sweetness anymore. I can't eat dates anymore. So it's amazing how your taste buds change, right? It is. If people just give it time, and I agree with you. I can't eat dates either. They're, I mean, I'll use them like in a salad dressing recipe, but they're just too sweet. And sometimes even when I make the, you know, the banana, you know, sorbet and the Vitamix. Sometimes I'm like, oh my God, this is so sweet. It, you're right. You know, you really can't adjust. Your taste buds do adjust. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's amazing. I see with my clients. I've, I've kind of gone into this. You probably have too. I've kind of gone, oh, yeah. There's an article that came out in the Permanente Journal that Aviv just showed me. Um, with the, They studied, what is it, two servings of Okay, so there's some evidence to show what we, me and you, AJ, have done with our clients. So you do the same thing as I do, but we get people off of sugar. And a lot of people come to me to lose weight or to get healthy, and I always identify the fact that um, a lot of these people are, are, are unable to lose weight and eat healthier because they have sugar addiction. Do you see that a lot? Absolutely, absolutely, because it's, it's not like they're just eating sugar on their kale. It's what they're eating it with, I think, that causes a lot of the problems. Right, and all the artificial sweeteners, the stevia, and all that stuff that's like, it's there's sugars everywhere, added sugars everywhere. Right. And, I, yeah, and there's, so there's a new study that's actually showing the same thing, that it takes about two weeks to, to change your taste buds. And it's actually published. I'm excited. I have to share this. But that's just hot off the press. But I've seen it for years. Like, it, we always say three weeks, but most people, it's like, you know, one to three weeks. Some people take a little bit longer. But the average person can get off their sugar addiction by just taking those out of their diet in, like, three weeks, and that will improve everything about their diet. It's, uh, it's so effective. Yeah. I, I agree. I think 21 days is a really good, you know, a goal to set to, 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 to really do this. Now, I, I, we're jumping ahead. Well, you don't know. You don't see the questions I have here. But you, <laughs> you brought something up that I was going to ask. I'm going to just jump ahead a little bit. You had mentioned sweeteners. And on page 79, you're talking a little bit about sugar addiction. And what I loved about what you said is that choosing whole food sweeteners while avoiding all calorie-free and added sweeteners is the goal. Calorie-free or non-nutritive sweeteners are perhaps worse than other sweeteners due to their powerful ability to perpetuate sugar cravings. I, I'd love for you to expound on that because I've been teaching people for years that they don't do themselves any favor by having stevia or erythritol or xylitol, that in fact it's worse. And I, I would love for you to give some credibility to that because that's been my experience with myself and all the clients I've worked with, that the zero calorie calorie sweeteners are in fact worse than even sugar. Absolutely. It's so interesting because, you know, people think, oh, we're doing such a good thing. But the research even shows that people gain weight, people don't lose weight when they're using these artificial sweeteners. So, yeah, artificial and, you know, stevia is like, you know, mucky muck because is it artificial? But either way, they're all non-caloric sweeteners. So they sweeten. They are designed either in the lab, mostly in the lab, to be hundreds to thousands of times sweeter than table sugar. So what happens? You are eating these highly heightened sweetened foods, and your taste buds recognize it as that's what your threshold of sweetness should be. And anyone that's ever had to get off of salt for any reason or gone from whole milk to skim milk knows what it's like to transition your taste buds because it's like all of a sudden when you stop eating the salt, you know, you eat something 
like that's less salty and it tastes salty and then you adjust and then you go down a little bit again and you could you absolutely can palpate how the difference in your taste buds are when you just start cutting down that that high high level of something so with sugars if you cut out hundreds and thousands of times sweet sweetness, then all of a sudden things start tasting sweet, like like we're saying, like sweet potatoes or candy. Sure. And like all of a sudden now we can barely eat fruity desserts. Like fruit has become a little bit too yeah. sweet because your taste buds literally get stripped away back to how we were when we were born. And anyone that's had a baby and accidentally tried breast milk, I'm no, I'm not raising my hand on that one. But if you've tasted it when that baby comes out of the womb and they have these fresh taste buds that have never been, you know, ruined by what we put in them nowadays, they it tastes sweet. And it tastes like sugar to them because they are so on. It's like I feel like over the years the taste, the tongue, and the taste buds get coated and just like with all the junk that we put on them, and it just heightens our need for sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. And it'll never get better unless you just pull all of that stuff out together. Absolutely. So you know, just say no. And is it true that like when we eat these foods with the zero calorie sweeteners like the stevia, erythritol, and xylitol, that our brains actually cause us to eat more food because it never gets the calorie reward. At least sugar has four calories a gram. These zero calorie sweeteners never provide. A, a, a calorie reward. Absolutely. Your, bo- your body is designed, we're brilliant. We're much more brilliant than we ever give ourselves credit for. But you get the taste of sweetness on your tongue that tells the brain immediately, oh, secrete these hormones because you're going to digest sugar, sweetness, carbohydrates. And you expect that. And when you don't have it, you still have those hormones that were secreted. So everything kind of gets downregulated and it absolutely affects what you, know, what you do. And, and also, there's also a psychological element to that besides the biochemical part. Psychologically speaking, how many times have you seen someone going out and having their Big Mac and fries with a Diet Coke because they think, well, if I'm having the Diet Coke, if I'm having this, this many calories, the Diet Coke will, will help. So it yeah. does, it, it, there's a psychological element to thinking you're sacrificing the full sugar version for the artificially sweetened version because you're saving calories, and then people tend to consume more calories. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for clarifying that because I tell people that all the time, but they don't seem to believe it for me. So do you have a favorite amino acid? <laughs> <laughs> no, no okay. I do not. All right. Do you? Well, no, I really don't even know what they are, but the reason I'm bringing it up, we, one of the things you talked about was lysine. And the reason I want to ask about it, because you're talking about how legumes are a rich source of lysine, an essential amino acid that could otherwise possibly fall short in a vegetarian diet, and that the amount of lysine in legumes is comparable to that in animal products, in addition to their fiber and protein contribution of the diet, they're good suppliers of the mineral of minerals calcium, iron, zinc, and selenium. The reason I want to talk about lysine is, believe it or not, I have had two clients that were born allergic to them. And so my question is, is they they have the anaphylactic thing where like, it's not just like an intolerance where they would have to go to the emergency room. Is there, is there ever any hope that they could eat these or is there something else in their vegan plant-based whole food diet that they could eat and not worry so much about lysine or, or could they take lysine and can that even be tested? Okay, that is. I've never even heard of that, and I, w- I actually don't have the answer to that. That, I mean, if there's a con- if there's a, gen- a genetic reason, if you're actually born with that, then I wonder there must be something else that you could take. Otherwise, you wouldn't survive because sure. it's an essential amino acid. So that's a very good question. I don't have the answer to it. Okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you for saying that. Now, speaking of legumes, in the recipe section, you talked about sprouting legumes. And is there? Do you actually sprout your own legumes, or and, and have you done it? And maybe you could just kind of quickly tell us how to do it because I've heard that it actually increases the nutrient profile of the legume when you do that. It does. It breaks down. It breaks down some of the inhibitors of absorption. So, and it also just yeah, it makes it easier for your body to digest and absorb. And I've tried doing it. And just like gardening, I I'm not very good at it because I'm just so busy. I'm, I do, can't pay them enough attention. But I've tried it in order. You know, when I write about it, I've I've tried it out myself. And basically, it has to do with actually. I think I detail it in the book about you soak you soak them and then you rinse and then a couple of days later you soak again and then you rinse and then you start. There's a you could get a sprouting kit or you could you could do it yourself or you put it in a jar and you make sure that the water is coming out, but it still stays wet. And then you'll start to see, it depends on the size of the legume or the nut or the, whatever you're sprouting or the grain, you'll see that um, a little sprout starts to come out. And so it takes, some of them take longer, some of them can do quicker. But I, I've tried it. I'm not very successful. Sometimes I buy them. I, I prefer them like that. You could sure. also, you know, get sprouted that are, you could get nowadays, you can get all sorts of stuff at the store, like even yeah. sprouted grain breads. And, yeah, you can get sprouted beans and legumes and nuts and seeds now at some stores or online. So that's really cool. It is. It's so much easier. But obviously, if you could do it yourself, it's more cost effective. And it is. It's so much. It's so healthy. It helps reduce phytates and it helps reduce a lot of things. And it helps the absorption of a lot of different things that you, you might want to, you know, just might want to try it. 
Yeah, I'm going to definitely play with that. So one of the things I learned in reading your book, and, I, and I'd love for you to expound on that, is you, you have a, your own pyramid that you did, that kind of combined your pyramid, and you took the best of your pyramid with the Mediterranean diet period, and you made your vegetarian diet period. You talk about having some tea every day. Why is that, and are there certain kinds we should have and other, maybe other kinds we should avoid? Yeah, and actually the tea part was uh, carried over and grandfathered in from the original plant-based pyramid. And this was based on when I was in graduate school, I was just kind of, this was before I was all plant-based, and it was as I was gathering information, which led me to becoming so passionately plant-based. But I was just reading a lot about tea, and there's a lot of phytonutrients in there that, you know, it's just like this plethora of phytonutrients. So I figure, why not add another source of getting phytonutrients? A lot of people don't drink enough water, so if you, you know, could boost it up with some flavor, some herbal tea, some tea with all those different polyphenols and everything in there, it's a good way to get more fluids into you in a healthy way. But um, the research really was kind of controversial, like some touted green tea as the best, but there's others saying that white tea is great and black tea is fine and oolong, those are the four types of tea leaves. But really, And also I was working on a book on, on tea many years ago. So basically I just saw there are so many vast benefits of consuming tea and a lot of people enjoy tea, sure. so I just I included it as an option as something that people might enjoy doing cool well i i, I mean is, is it okay if i have herbal tea or that doesn't count no absolutely it counts i mean you want to make sure whatever herbal there's different types of herbal teas you don't want all those supplemental weird stuff but um there's a lot of really healthy ones and you don't need the caffeine if people are sensitive to caffeine because some people are there's so many decaffeinated or herbal ones that will be just as beneficial terrific now i did something you just said i didn't know it said you said that you were not yet plant-based when you attended graduate school i did not know that Yes, it's been many, many moons, and I had tried. I wanted to go plant, and when I, I told you the story when I read John Robbins' book in, I think I was in junior high, uh, when I read it, and I wanted to go vegan. And I, well, I didn't know the word vegan; I was vegetarian at the time. So I tried, and I didn't know what I was doing. And my mom never heard of it, and didn't know what to do, what to cook for me. So I was eating, you know, rice cakes and fruit rolls and whatever I knew that just didn't have animal products in it. And I wasn't thriving, and my parents got scared, and they were worried about me, and they talked me back into eating the cool. regular diet. Hey, and then I was a fast forward a few years. I was a personal trainer, and telling everyone to eat all their protein, like every other trainer says. And but that's when I started grad school, and I was started looking at this because I after I read that first book, I kept reading. I read everything I could find on nutrition, everything about vegetarian nutrition, just eating healthfully. I was like, like you, like you. We both are so similar with that too. We want to read and learn and find out. But it wasn't until I went through graduate school when I started picking up all these clues that showed me that it is indeed not only the most, you know, there's not all these other ethical reasons to eat a vegetarian diet, but there were so many health benefits. And, like, some of the clues that I picked up that I often talk about because a lot of people don't know this, but when you're sitting there in graduate school, in medical school, in nutrition school, and you're looking at the handouts, the information, the books that are given to you, giving the recommendations, for instance, you know, make sure they have three servings of dairy every day and the stuff that we're taught to teach, you'll see in the small print at the bottom of the page that it's sponsored by the Dairy Council. And I started to pick up on, oh, wait a second, if they have a paid vested interest in me getting this information, maybe it might not be 100% accurate. And then you start questioning things. And what I loved about graduate school is that it enabled me to see that and to see that, oh, wait, there is protein in plants. There is iron. You can, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to eat meat to not be iron deficient. There were all those questions that are always, you know, the most commonly believed things that we learn and we're taught and it's like just infused in us since preschool didn't necessarily have to be true. So I was so grateful that I was able to see it from there. And then now, now have, going looking backwards, it was the best decision I ever made. And it, it just rings true that, yes, it is not only what I believed in, but it was absolutely that most health-promoting diet that we have. Cool. Now, you, in, you had talked about how your parents didn't want you at first to be veg, and you even told the story in the book where they actually staged an intervention to force you to eat meat. <laughs> Well, you know what's so funny about that story, AJ, is that my mom had lunch with her today, oh, my, the nurse friend. So, my, yeah, so my, my parents had a really good friend who's a nurse, and they're still friends to this day. So it was like, I don't know, 30 years ago or something. And they were, she was like, well, you know, where are you going? They took me out to dinner, and they ordered me a steak. It was a teriyaki steak with a pineapple ring on top. And they said, you know, and, and Kendra was telling me, well, you know, you need to get your iron. You won't, you're going to be protein deficient if you don't eat this way. Well, I, so I got scared back. I, I mean, I remember that I would talk about how, well, how hard that was to know what I knew and, and still eat that meat. But so t her, she ended up, her husband ended up having um, a cardiovascular, I think he actually had a heart attack, and they're vegan now. 
good. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Isn't that crazy? And they had lunch today, and they went to make sure that they had vegan food for lunch today. I usually, I love that the way that story went full circle. That's so cool. Do you think that if you had already gone plant based, you might not have gone to uh, to become a registered dietitian? Because what what they didn't really teach you had to learn all this outside of school, right? To be a plant based dietitian. Well, I honestly, I felt like I I had all that information before from all of the reading I did prior to school and it was like it was reinforced in school because you know a lot I get this question every day people write me and they say oh I want to be a dietitian but I don't want to have to learn all this stuff how could you sit through that I can't but the truth is how many classes are you really learning that you know biochemistry and microbiology and organic chemistry and even counseling and there's so many other st- like statistics there's so many classes that give you such a strong foundation to understand why you're saying what you're saying that I absolutely recommend that anyone that wants to teach nutrition really goes back and takes it in because there's so much more to learn than just the actual dietary advice that they give. And you and they actually teach you, especially when you're in a graduate program, they teach you how to sift through the research and be objective. And it get, kind of gives you more of that scientific perspective so that you can go in there and be, you know, confident in these choices. And I'm so glad I did. And I, I can't imagine ever doing it the other way. I still regret not going to med school and I still think sure. I want to go to medical school. You know, or, I think you should, honestly. I really think you should. Maybe I know it's still it's when my kids are older. I told my I told my kids I'm like I'll go to med school with you guys, but I don't think either of them are interested. <laughs> so, that, to become a registered dietitian, it's like at least six years, wasn't it, to to do all that training for for my dietitian yeah. degree? Yeah. It took me a while because I was working full time as a personal trainer, and because I hadn't finished all my pre med requirements from undergrad, it took me seven years. But that's not normal. I think it could take like um, I don't know. The internship was a year and a half, and the master's pro. I don't know. It, it, it could be shorter if you have a degree in something that's pre med oriented. So it just depends on what you have as your background. Wow, it just it sounds like a lot of books and a lot of tests. It is. It's a lot of books and a lot of tests, and it was fascinating information. That's why I never, never did that. So uh, you, you had mentioned in the book, like personal trainer, you gave your clients a totally different diet then than you would give them now. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, completely. I was doing what everyone was doing, and what I was, I went by the books. I, I was going by, and this is while I was in grad school. I started personal training during I think graduate school or was I an undergrad and um and I was going by literally what they teach you to say and it's all about the protein all about the veggies all about the you know eating portion control and absolutely I would never recommend what I recommended then but I hear it every single day when I'm at the gym and it drives me crazy all the trainers telling their their clients to eat all that stuff and are you getting your protein at breakfast are you getting and it just it's so maddening and it's so and that's why when I started personal training and the first person said well what am I supposed to eat I realized wait I don't want to tell you what to eat without really knowing why I'm saying it, not from a couple chapters in my personal training handbook. So that's when I signed up to start with grad school. Now, you just said when you're at the gym every day. So let's talk about exercise. You (laughs) really do work out every single day? Well, like you, I travel a lot. I don't travel half as much as you, but I do travel a lot and I've got the kids. So my dream would be to work out two hours a day. I I know that sounds insane. And some days I I have to hustle myself to the gym. But if I had it my ways, I would exercise every single day for at least an hour. I love to, but that doesn't work in the real world. Like, so I really average, in fact, the doctor asked me today. So I said about five to six days a week on average. And um, I try to get at least a good hour in. But yeah, I love exercising. It's, I've always, I had this weird thing when I was a kid where I would see my mom doing like Jane Fonda and I couldn't want watch her exercise. I had to participate. And I even found recorded cassette tapes of me teaching aerobics classes at like five or six years old to our friends and my sister. Um, you were bit by the exercise bug early. It took me quite a long time. What What do you do for exercise? Do you do a variety of things? Or I do. And by the way, for the record, I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy that you're exercising. I saw your muscles at Summerfest and I'm so proud of you. But, um, yes. Mm-hmm. I like to shake it up. I like, I love, I really love running, but I don't get to run all the time. So I, I go to the gym. Like today I met my best friend and we go and we, we do like, you know, half hour to an hour, usually an hour of cardio. And then we do some weights. I, I'm kind of a gym rat, um, but I also love taking classes and I like doing dancey stuff because I was a dancer for, for like 20 years. So I don't know. I like to just shake it up and try different things. And I mostly like to go to the gym. Right. Now, as important as it is to exercise, how important is the food? And, 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 you know, people always want to know what every guest I've ever interviewed eats. So would you mind telling us like on a daily basis kind of what, what you are eating? Oh, sure. I know. I'm kind of boring because I like, I, like, I always tell everyone to get variety. So the way I get variety is I go to different locations to get my food because I figure I'm getting it from different soil. So I'm getting different nutrients and I do as much variety as I can, but I love 
Okay. First thing in the morning, I'll have green tea with soy milk. And then as soon as I get hungry, I have a ginormous, huge salad. And it's one of those, like we always talk about the shock and awe, awe salads, where I have a huge bowl of, I'll do romaine lettuce and kale and corn and beans. And so I mix up the type of beans and I mix up the type of lettuces and I'll do, um, what else? Artichoke hearts, whatever I could find, anything, just vegetables, lots of vegetables. I'll put potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, whatever I have leftovers from the night before. So I usually make, I usually have hummus and chili in my fridge, which are both the ones from my book, actually. These are the ones I eat all the time. And I'll usually throw that on the salad. And then I love making those oil-free dressings. Like, you taught me how to make oil-free dressings, and I'm still obsessed with all of your dressings and all of your, I, you're my favorite chef. I love all of your food. Uh -huh. But I, I so I always put an oil free dressing on or um and now I actually like when I when I don't I don't have time to, to make a dressing because I'm traveling, the Whole Foods brand makes that oil free uh, tahini dressing that you said Charles loves too and I use that a lot too. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that you eat vegetables for breakfast because people criticize me for doing that. And it's nice to know that another, you know, healthy, fit vegan actually starts their day, you know, savory with vegetables because that's what they do in all other parts of the world. What did they eat for breakfast in the Mediterranean? Do you know? Well, a lot of bread. They did a lot of bread. They'll do cere they call them cereals. So it would be like a, a whole grain, like a cooked grain. So probably, you know, um, it's been a while since I actually read all that, the actual, because there were really interesting reports like that study in Crete when they were looking at this huge population right post-World -war, War II where all of this really started. And they were just looking at what the, these people were consuming just to get an idea of how they needed to help them and all that. And that's the Leland Alba study. But they, they would do like they would have bread and they would have fruit and they would eat like six or seven small meals throughout the day. And, uh, and even in a lot of the traditional diets that's what they do but yeah cereals but not as i mean nobody sweetens nobody eats you know cold cereal like that that's so new like that's obviously with industrialization but i i agree like it's so hard to have sweet first thing in the morning i don't like sweet ever but yeah. i like to wake up to savory too right because i think once you especially if you're a sugar addict or recovering sugar addict like me to start your day with sweet it's just the whole day is about that so i think starting your uh you know starting your day in a savory way is is Pretty cool, actually. So you have a fan, and do they eat like this? And if so, was it a struggle to get the kids on board? Because every time we get this question when anybody has kids, how do I get my kids to eat healthy and fruits and vegetables in particular? Oh, AJ, this has literally been the biggest challenge of my entire life because when you have kids, all you want, you, I care about my clients, I care about my eyes, I care about everyone, but it's when it's your children, you just want them to do everything you want them to do, and you just want to make them do it, like, just do it, this is what mommy says, I'm a dietitian, you should listen to me, but it's very hard, and it's not perfect, and I've also had the opportunity to experience both having a partner who was not on board, and then now having one who is on board, the same one, who got on board, which is honestly the biggest difference, it's night and day, so my heart goes out, because this literally just happened, but for years, I struggled with the dissonance of having mommy say one thing and daddy say something else, and the kids just go, they know how to manipulate you around that to get what they want, and they know how to do that. So that was really a struggle. And for us, it was more of a getting the sugary foods out of the house. And, you know, it was, and, and, you know, they just, they would still have that, like the cheese, like if they would have dairy and eggs outside of the house, they it would, it would be hard for them to let go of their taste buds when they were in the house. So I, I understand for most people, when you don't have your partner on board, it is very tough, very challenging. And I've seen what it can do and I felt it and I've experienced it. So what I did then, because it's different than what I do now was I did the best that I could. And I, I would cook all the time, even when we would go out, because that happens a lot. When we would go out, I would try to choose options for them. I would try to, I would bribe them. You know, if you eat this many pieces of broccoli and this many peas, you know, you can have a healthy dessert or whatever, so, you know. So I would, I totally do that whole thing because basically in my mind, I'm looking at them as little bodies that are growing and rapidly their cells are dividing more faster and, and more importantly than ever else in the, any other time of your life during childhood. I want those vegetables into their body so I do what I was taught you know role modeling it of course and of course um repetition so you just you keep if they hate broccoli then you give them broccoli one day and then you give them a different way another day and then you keep bringing it back and bring it back for months and years and years and I've done stuff like I've tried all of it I tried the hiding it in foods you know getting the special sauce you know where you <laughs> infuse it with vegetables I'm making a lot like I love Drina Burton's recipe she's so yeah. amazing with family foods and kids sure. foods and I highly recommend her new book the plant-powered fam plant-powered families 
so she has all these tricks for getting um, these these foods that are so nutritious to taste like the foods that our kids are you know they want to like because by the way not even just you're not even just dealing with your own home because it's a lot it's not easy but it's easier to control your own home but when you send them to school there's always a holiday or a birthday party or such and such a thing where they're celebrating someone's you know they got enough tickets for the the local pizza place and they're always exposed to junk food no matter what you do so it's like it's like doing controlling your home the best that you can and providing them with all the different things. So I do, you know, you try to do the green smoothies. I've bribed them with money. <laughs> I've done so many things in like certain desperate ways where I just really want them to eat this food no matter what. And right. now that I've got a partner on the same space as me, my house is perfectly good. There is no junk food in my house. Right. When they're hungry, it's so much easier because when they're hungry, they eat. You know, now we all enjoy the meals together. I'm trying to cook more often and um, more variety, and I'm introducing it. So it's a whole different planet when you've got your partner on board. So my all I could say for when you don't, is you do your best, you keep offering, you try to, if, you know, every little bite of something that they like is a victory. Focus on fruits because a lot of kids prefer fruits and it's very hard to get them to eat the vegetables. Yeah. And even fruits are so healthful that at least they're getting a lot of the nutrients in from there. And then the other thing is just not to beat yourself up because no one's going to be perfect. And I, I've talked to so many moms, I've talked to so many dietitian moms that aren't even plant-based but are just like trying to get their kids to eat healthy. This is, this is everyone. This is pretty much every kid. I've, I've probably run into maybe a dozen kids in my entire mommyhood, dietitianhood that have had kids that, oh, I want vegetables or I want fruits and that they actually crave the healthy stuff. It, it does happen. It does exist. I, my kids are nothing like that. They, they rebel in every way, shape, and form. But you know what? They're learning. And I see the, the little victories of when they have, when they ask for broccoli or when they, you know, when they prefer something healthier or when I could find a bar that's really healthy or I could make something that's really healthy, but they love it. I, it's a huge celebration and it's very exciting. But I, my heart goes out. It's, we, are all, we are all doing it. We do our best. We really need to reframe. I don't know how we do this to reframe society because you know you go to. Like, I wrote an article about this called "Redefining Normal" on my blog because I went. We had my son had a basketball game, and after basketball practice, he came out. It was just practice, I think, and he came out and he was handed the goldfish, the high fructose, high fructose corn syrup juice thing, fake oh, juice, cool. and some like Oreo snack, 100 calorie snack pack. And that was his post-workout snack. It was like, uh, and I literally, I, I lost it and I grabbed it out of his hand and gave it back to the mom. And, and he was crying and my husband's yelling at me and it was like so embarrassing. And it was a whole scene. And you literally, you have to, it sucks to have your kid feel like the odd person out. You know, it's, yeah. Oh, it's awful. It's awful. So we have a lot of work to do in society as well. But you were actually saving his life. You just mentioned your blog. What is your blog and how do people find out more about you and get in touch with you? Thank you. It's uh, plantbaseddietitian.com. And I'm very active on Facebook as Plant Based Dietitian and Twitter as at Plant Dietitian. And, yeah, I mean – uh, we, we, I think it takes a village, <laughs> but it also does start with you. And I think what all the research shows, and I always love to look at research first, but what the research shows is that it all starts with you and, and role, modeling, role modeling how you want them to eat and having doing it yourself, and that's all you can do. You really can't force anyone to do something. And one of my quotes in the book that I, I keep saying because it's, it's, so, it's so apropos so many times is that you could lead a human to healthy, but you can't make them eat. True, true, very true. Yep. You mentioned Drina Burton, just so you know, everybody listening, we're going to be interviewing her next month with her new book that's, that's geared towards family. So that's great. You know, I love when you said that you, know, you start your day with some green tea and soy milk. And when you're hungry, you eat. I like that. You don't just automatically eat when you get up. You actually wait till you're hungry. You know, I've been on this path on mindfulness, and and I, I, I talk about it. It's one of my veg ten in the book. It's um, ca I call it CCC, cautious calorie consciousness, and it's about you know the fact that we're caught up in our busy lives, and it's so easy to just you know shovel food down and just eat, or or just to eat when someone told you you're supposed to eat. Like we hear these diets, that popular diets that come out that say eat three meals a day and two snacks a day, or you know eat five meals a day and no don't snack, or you know, there's all these different regulations and rules, but really it all comes down to you and what you need to eat and really for honing in. And a lot of us have lost track of the hunger satiety 
uh, cues. And I think it's really important for us to kind of try to go back in and recognize, wait, do, am I hungry? Because your body, only your body knows when it needs to eat. And your body will self-regulate. If you look at animals in the wild, you don't see obese animals because they're eating when they're hungry and they eat when they can get food and they move and they're listening to their intuitions. And so I focus a lot on that in the book. I'm focusing on it personally. And I think it's, and I've worked on that a lot with clients about mindful eating, eating when you're hungry, stopping before you're full, and also eat, enjoying your food and, and recognizing your environment when you're eating and trying to chew your food and taste your food. And that's kind of a macrobiotic principle too. But I think it's really a powerful, powerful resource that we can all kind of tap into. I, and I agree, and I'm also working on mindfulness. Now, you mentioned stopping before you fall, and you brought up a concept in the book, and I, it's a Japanese word like harabacha, racha, la, 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 la. Harahachibu. <laughs> eat until you're 80% full, but Juliana, I'm already 100% full when I, I mean, you know what I'm saying? How do you know what 80% full is? I I just, I can't fathom how you know how you, you know, it's not like a gas tank. How do you know when you're 80% full? I, I, it's already too late by the time I'm 80% full. <laughs> That's a really good point. And it's what it is, it's a tradition that they do in Japan. And it's called harahachibu. And it me, the actual tr- direct translation means eat until you're 80% full. So, no, of course you don't know exactly when you're going to be 80% full. It takes about 20 minutes for the food to get into your stomach and trigger the satiety signals. So that's when we could make some different things. There's certain things you could do behaviorally that may you know, make you more aware. So that, that is all about the whole idea of like tapping in and really knowing when you're hungry. So I do this exercise, like before I'm going to eat, I literally, I mean, it sounds so silly, but I'll close my eyes. I'll touch my stomach. I'm like, okay, am I really hungry, physically hungry, or am I bored or am I stressed or am I emotionally eating? And if I'm truly hungry, that's when I eat. And then while I'm eating, so this is when a perfect day, like this doesn't happen every meal, okay, but I'm just saying what I'm striving for. So then when I'm on a perfect day, I set the environment, I shut the TV, shut the computer, nothing's on, it's quiet, the kids are all listening and sitting well behaved at the table, ha <laughs> ha, that doesn't happen very often. And you take one bite and you eat it and you go slower. So if you chew really well and you're really extracting your nutrients and you're really aware of what you're putting in your body, you will slowly, you know, you'll, it'll take longer to eat it. You will notice you're starting to feel like, oh, I can feel it in my stomach. And it takes practice. And, I mean, I don't know if anyone's perfect at this, but it's really interesting that they do that in Japan where they have these higher, you know, lo- longevity rates. And that's, they talk about this in the wonderful book, The Blue Zones. Mm-hmm. So it's a practice. Yep. Cool. Now, you had mentioned that the body, that there's no obese or overweight animals in nature and that the body would self-regulate. So how do you feel about one of the uh, approaches that's often taught in the whole food plant-based world, which is the concept of following the principles of calorie density and eating ad libitum until comfortably full versus many of these programs, even some being taught plant-based now where we have to count every calorie, weigh and measure our food and have food scales with us every time we go out to a restaurant? Yeah, well, what it sounds good to everyone, right? Like, I feel like the anti dietitian because I hate weighing, measuring, calculating, portion controlling. Like, I, I find it so tedious and so horrific that it, it's like, it, it kills, like, I don't even want to do it. Like, people come to me and ask me to do that for them as their dietitian, and I won't. Like, I will send them to someone else because I don't think it's effective. You know, I mean, look at your amazing sure. success with just looking at calorie density. I agree. I agree. I, I think that's really the ticket. So if you don't mind, we have quite a few uh, questions from the listeners. And, you don't, you know, feel free just because we're almost out of time. You know, you can answer them fairly quickly unless it requires, you know, obviously a longer answer. Okay. So okay. Uh, the first one, Sandy, uh, no question. Just give her a hug. So I'm giving oh, a hug. Right okay. Tracy wants to say, wants to ask if about omega-6 versus omega-3. As whole food plant-based eaters, do we need to worry about that? Absolutely, we need to worry about that. That's one of the nutrients we need to be mindful of. Now, one of the best ways to help this is to not have oils because oils tend to be higher in omega sixes. But the other way, so this is a very, this is a, this could take up an hour. We could talk about this for hours, but so I'm going to try to make this as as uh, short as possible. We need to make sure we're getting a better ratio of omega three to omega six. So we need to make sure we're consuming enough ALA, the omega three form of these fatty acids. So where is that? The flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, walnuts, soy foods. So basically, if you make sure you're getting about two to three tablespoons of those kinds of seeds or a quarter cup of walnuts to half a cup of walnuts or some soy products every day, then you're likely getting enough. But this, what's so fascinating about this, and I'm, I'm taking this, I'm deferring to Brenda Davis, who is my mentor, and she is, I, I've dubbed her the essential fatty acid queen because she studied this so extensively, and I, so I'm recommending what she recommends um, because of her knowledge of this. 
she suggests because we don't have any long-term data on vegans and ha- because, okay, vegans have lower levels of the longer chain fatty acids, the EPA and DHA, because we're not taking in a direct source. We're taking it in from the ALA sources and we're, and then we have to convert it. So what happens is what, with the minimal data that we do have is that uh, people have lower, vegans have lower levels than fish eaters. Okay. But the question is, is that a problem? Do we know? I mean, we know that vegans have lower risk for cardiovascular disease. We know that we have lower risk for Alzheimer's disease. But there are some concerns about potentially cognitive decline. We just have questions. We just don't have answers to a lot of that. So what Brenda Davis recommends is either doubling the amount of the ALA, and I can actually give you the numbers of how much. That's on my chart. I could tell you exactly right now. It is for um, men, you would need 3.2 grams a day, and for women, 2.2 grams a day. And like I said, I don't love to count and calculate stuff. The other thing that a lot of us are starting to recommend, and Dr. Gregor concurred with what I've been doing, which is what Brenda was recommending as well, uh, and those are the two people I go to for every question I have about nutrition because they know so much, and it is recommending a long-chain fatty acid source. So there are these microalgae formulas out there, and as little as I, I mean, as much as I don't like to recommend supplements, it's something that you can consider. So you could take 250 milligrams a day of these microalgae DHA EPA formulas, and then you don't really have to worry. Now, not to say that you don't need to, it's really still good to have the ALA sources, but because it's so complex and because we just don't have, you know, tons of data on this, it might be something that people might consider. And when I have pregnant and breastfeeding clients and older men, I absolutely, I recommend that they do consume these, the, the supplements. Good. Well, thank you. And Starla would like to know that if eating a low-sodium diet, need we be concerned about low iodine levels and the effect it can have on our thyroid? Excellent question. And yes, it is a concern. We need 150 micrograms a day of iodine. And we don't eat it. We're eating, we're not using iodized salt. I mean, most people, even if they are using salt, you're, they're using all the fancy salts, the Himalayan salts and the sea salts, and you're not getting, it has to say iodized for it to be, to have the iodine in it. So that's another thing we can consider, either taking sea vegetables. Sea vegetables are a great source of iodine. So you could, if you want to get those little, dul- you taught me about those, right, dulse. the dulse sprinkles. Dulse. Yeah, dulse is good. Yeah, you could use that instead of instead of salt, and it tastes like salt. And or you could use like I I still love those Noritos, so I'll use like a nori wrapper and I'll wrap some hummus and some veggies in there, and that's one of my favorite snacks. Or you can, you know, you could also use like those Eden beans that they use the sea vegetables instead of salt. That's another way to get some sea vegetables in. Now there are a lot of people that I know, including my husband, that don't like the taste of anything fishy. So like the whole the sea vegetable thing is too remnant of the sea, and he won't eat it. So then you can supplement with that too, 150 micrograms. But again, too much is not good, and too little is not good. But you need to have just the right amount in order to help, especially like people like me and you who are eating so much cruciferous vegetables. Sure. You know, we love our kale and broccoli and collard are and all that. So we need to make sure we're getting our iodine and our selenium that to make sure that we're absorbing all of that and able to use it. Great. Thank you. Karen wants to know, are there any nutrients that whole food plant-based eaters may miss that can affect gum health or what can we eat to maximize gum and oral health? You know, it's a good question. I kind of out of my purview, but I would, you know, it's it's still a, it's very vascularized and it's you know getting all the same blood that you're getting throughout the body. So I would I would just estimate that whatever you're doing for your ultimate health and your cardiovascular system in general is going to be the same efficacy for the for your mouth and gums and everything like that. I don't know about teeth either, but if you're eating all of these. All these nutrients that we're talking about here and you're eating all these foods, you're better off than anyone that's eating candy, which we know is really bad for oral health. And we know any kind of sugar and any kind of processed food that's going to be not so good on on your mouth. But I would ask a dentist for more. Um, Kristen wants to know if there's any adjustments that people have to make during pregnancy and breastfeeding and children if they're on a whole food plant-based diet. Of course. I mean, absolutely. You need to be really aware of what you're taking in. You need to, that's when I recommend the DHA supplement and EPA supplement. You know, you want to make sure you're getting enough calories, but a a lot of people overdo it on the calories because we really don't need all that much. And you really don't need all that many calories additional until really like your second and third trimester. But yeah, you need to make sure you're getting your omega-3s, eat your, those ALA sources, make sure you're getting your plant protein. So make sure you're getting your beans. And it's basically the same, it's the same recommendation. So, you know, have a cup to a cup and actually a cup and a half of legumes every day, have three, at least three servings of leafy greens a day, because you're going to get all that folate and all that stuff that you need to build a healthy baby. But also it's just really trying, you know, it's hard to get through that first trimester, but there are specific guidelines. And this is what I work with people. And there's articles I'm happy to send 
different information to people for the actual detail stuff. And there's all actually full sections in my book for pregnancy, breastfeeding, and for children because that, that would go beyond the time we have today. Sure. But we're all just eating the, this healthful diet and um, taking your B12. And D, and making sure your D, but this is for everyone too, making sure your serum D levels are healthy and then making sure that you, you keep them up if you need to supplement or however you're getting your D. And also calcium is also important. But again, greens and beans and broccoli and almonds and all that stuff that we're talking about is what's going to give you all of these nutrients anyway. Well, that's funny that you just mentioned D because I have just about two questions left, and we had several people ask about vitamin D. Apparently, their levels are low, and some of them are supplementing from what their doctor told them to take, something like 50,000 international units twice a week, and their levels are still low. So if you could just, I know we could do a whole call on vitamin D, but if you could just briefly touch on that. Vitamin D is like this big enigma right now in the research world. Like it's just, it's bizarre because no matter where you live, you know, no matter what latitude you are, we're still seeing very high incidence of D deficiency. So, you know, you really shouldn't be getting it from food no matter what you're eating, but try to incorporate the vitamin D rich, you know, fortified plant milks and stuff like that. But if you're not, you need, that would be, you need, if you can't get your levels to a healthy serum, you know, what the ideal is, the optimal range, then you should ask your physician for a therapeutic dose. I mean, that's rare that you can't bring it up with supplementing. Most people, they could take 2,000 IU, three, up to 5,000 IU a day, and you could safely bring up your serum levels. But if you're not able to get them to optimize at, at that dosage of 5,000 IU a day, then you want to be monitored because it is a fat-soluble vitamin, and that would be something you would consult your physician with. Excellent. Well, you just are a treasure trove of information. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, now I have one last question. I actually think it's a really good one because I never really thought about it. But Billy writes that there are lots of nutrition tracking software programs available, chronometer, spark people, nutrition data, et cetera, where one can enter the food they consume and get feedback about what nutrients they are getting and what nutrients they are lacking. My question is, how reliable are these programs? Most days I get over 100% of all my nutrients except vitamin D. I use chronometer, but I am really tracking my but am I tracking my nutrients accurately? Accurately, Is it important to meet 100% of all my nutrients every day? What nutrients are most important and what nutrients should I watch not to overconsume? Okay, that's a lot of questions. And I can't answer for the, um, the accuracy of the sites because there's so many different ones that I haven't tested them. But if you wanted to do it yourself and really test it, I, you can go to the USDA nutrient database and just plug it in, but it's not like it's, it's, you have to do one single ingredient at a time and it's kind of time consuming. If you really are putting it into that, I'm going to guess that there, most of them are at least very close to estimating appropriately because a lot of, you know, a lot of resources go into making those, but I can't vouch for all of them. That being said, I do not believe you need to get 100% of everything every single day. I don't think, I mean, it'd be great, but I don't know if in the ideal world if everyone could do that every single day. What I like to look at is your overall diet. Like for instance, if you're traveling and or it's your birthday and you happen to, you know, mess up, I wouldn't think that you've ruined your whole lifestyle because again, this is not a diet. This is a lifestyle and it is about your overall total consumption. And I believe that, you know, if you're, if you're mostly getting 100% good for you, most people aren't. And you could always you know, like relax a little and look at what the standard American is eating and feel like you're doing a lot, you know, you're, you're way, way ahead of them. Right. So I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be so concerned. Again, I don't like to count and calculate, but good for, good for this one, this person for doing that and whoever can, can do that. But I don't think it's absolutely necessary for everyone. I think it's good to do it for a snapshot just to see, like, if you don't know what you're eating, you haven't ever checked it out, then yeah, go onto one of those sites, throw it in there see what you get, and then you could have an average, and you'll kind of get an idea of what you're getting. And, again, you're not going to get the B12 unless you're getting the supplement in enough numbers, and that's something you need to, you need to be aware of. Make sure your vitamin D is level, and that's, that's the, the, those are the two things you really need to be aware of. And then all the other things we talked about, just lots of leafy greens and beans, a little bit of nuts and seeds, and you should be golden. Right. I love your song. That, um, do you still have your DVD available? Because I love your song about beans and greens. Which song about beans and greens? Yeah. Plant-based dietitian <laughs> to save the world. Remember that song? Oh, I remember that song, but I don't remember. Oh, because you got your beans. Oh, you got your greens. You got yeah, yeah, yeah. So that no, that was our that was our documentary to your health, and we don't have it for sale anymore. Unfortunately, we were going to update it and bring it back, but um. I love the song. Maybe you could just release the song as a single because that was cool. So my last <laughs> question, and it doesn't really have anything to do with nutrition necessarily, but I always ask everybody that I interview, and it could be personal or professional life, who inspired you the most? Who inspires me the most? Yeah, or inspired if they yeah. It, mm-hmm. Oh my God, there's so many people. Okay, if I had to choose one, um, 
Oh my God, there's so many people and it depends on what you're talking about. I would say, well, I'm going to say my husband because my husband has made such an incredible, extraordinary transformation that I've never seen anything like that. And he literally inspires me on a daily basis with his, his light and his energy of changing, changing himself, which to me shows me that anything could happen in this world. And he made me believe in miracles again. Well, that's fantastic. So if he, if he ever gets upset with you, you can just play him the last few minutes of this interview. <laughs> okay, yeah, exactly. That's terrific. Well, so thank you so much. It's just this, the time has gone so quickly. Before we say goodbye to our listeners, just once again, tell us where they can find you and the best way to keep in touch with you. Thank you, AJ, so much. I would say you could find all my blogs and my information on plantbaseddietitian.com. And I love Facebook. I'm, on, I'm there on, at Plant Based Dietitian and Twitter at, at Plant Dietitian. And I'm posting all the time and sharing, and I try to answer all of my messages um, as much as I can and as quickly as I can. Great. Well, thank you so much, Juliana. I appreciate your time, and I look forward to listening to this again because I wasn't, wasn't unable to take notes on some of the things that you said, so I love to you know, hear this again, and it will be available soon that you can share it with your people as well. Thank you so much, AJ. It's nice to see you again and hear you again. You're welcome, and thank all of you for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>